MotorhomeDiaries.com. Hey everybody, we're in Olathe, Kansas. I'm with Brad Spangler. Brad, thanks for being with Motorhome Diaries. Hi, Pete. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Brad? I'm uh, 40 years old, and basically after becoming a libertarian circa 1990, I uh, was active as a Libertarian Party activist for about a little over a decade. Uh, in the early 2000s, I started coming to an awareness that, that perennial Libertarian frustration with uh, the ineffectiveness of the party meant that we needed to branch out into other ways of trying to popularize our ideas and, and try to take the struggle for freedom to a new level and new directions. Because I became a libertarian by reading the works of Murray Rothbard and becoming what was called at the time an anarcho-capitalist, I came to the realization that we were going to have to try to start being more direct about how we put the message of a completely free society out there, of its benefits, of its moral superiority, of its supreme practicality. Because reform, uh, political reform is not only extraordinarily difficult and has to be fought for very, very piecemeal, what's also going on with that is it also distorts the radical message. The strength of a radical viewpoint is its consistency and the way it works together holistically by addressing all of the problems that are interrelated to each other in the current system. Can you talk about the mediums that you're active with to get the message out? Like I said, I, I started Moving into um, outside the party activism in the early 2000s, one of the things I first started doing was uh, helping out with uh, Thomas L. Knapp and Rational Review News Digest. It's a daily update of news and, and links of interest to libertarians of all stripes. But what they're doing is that they're selecting the things that ought to be looked at. They're, they're helping set an agenda for the activists in the movement. At the same time, I then moved into uh, blogging and uh, other forms of online activism and because blogging is a conversation I, I really came to the decision that uh, for, from the other people that I talked with that I needed to really start promoting what I see as the most radical most principle most consistent version of the libertarian philosophy which is agorism as a result it, starting late in 2005 or early 2006 I believe I set up a, a wiki site, or a, a website anyway, uh, to put agorist writings out there for public consumption and try to answer questions and provide general information on what agorism is. And that's agorism.info. Late in 2006 and early 2007, the project that, that's been consuming the most of my attention, the Center for a Stateless Society, basically we're trying to become a sort of market anarchist media center to try to produce an ongoing stream of commentary and, and research and analysis on the news as it happens. And if your political views align with ours, we want to serve as your ammunition factory, your intellectual ammunition factory, to allow you to put the ideas out there of a free society. In addition to contributors and social media activists, we also need contributing writers and help us provide that stream of commentary and research. Can you uh, uh, describe what agorism is? We uh, we continue to run into people who self-describe as agorists, but we still uh, run into a lot of people who are uh, who, who have just heard that term for the first time. Sure. Um, I, I spoke earlier about the impracticality of political reform in an electoral system. What we're really talking about is, is truly revolutionary change. And in order to accomplish that, we have to have what's referred to by some as a plausible promise of how that can be achieved. The way we do that is by jump-starting the system of law and security that a free society would have in the first place. This flows from Murray Rothbard's understanding that the state itself is a criminal gang. It's not merely a wrong way of approaching politics. Politics itself is wrong. The state must be abolished because it is in fact crime. We don't have a political problem, we have a crime control problem. So agorism takes the, the understanding of how a free society's criminal justice system would work and applies that to the single biggest criminal justice problem, the state itself. 
because market actors rather than political institutions would be the source of security, arbitration, law, and so forth in a stateless society, those actors have to emerge in a way that is going to be illegal. In essence, the state is never going to uh, legalize uh, its own abolition, of course. It's not going to assent to that. And that really doesn't matter. Okay, It doesn't matter what laws are on the books if those laws aren't enforceable and can't be held uh, to, to to actually have control over people's lives. There are many, many laws that the Roman Empire had on its books when it fell that were never repealed. Um, but, you know, they became dust in the wind. This is the situation we're facing today. And because of the state's own instabilities anyway, we, we have to look at, you know, how we're going to jumpstart the process of a uh, stateless legal system. We're, we're talking about the ideas that Rothbard had about free market courts as actually uh, dispute resolution organizations, uh, binding arbitration based on natural rights, that sort of thing, uh, and contract. These have to emerge from underground. There, there, there's no other way. Um, and in order for that to happen, there has to be what amounts to market demand for them. And this can only be accomplished by a, a change in popular consciousness. In essence, state authority is based on, not so much on guns, because there's not someone pointing a gun at you literally 24-7. And this really goes back to what Labuetti said back, you know, several centuries ago in his Discourse on Voluntary Servitude, that it's the people's assent to their enslavement that is really the linchpin of state power. To get rid of that, we simply want to talk about why state power is not morally legitimate. If that understanding is spread widely enough, then what's going to happen is people are going to ignore the state as much as possible, go about their lives, build real productivity, build real solutions, even if it's dangerous to do so. And eventually their interactions and their productivity are going to give rise to a stateless legal system. And when that stateless legal system is powerful enough, it will in fact suppress the state as criminal activity. Eventually there will come a day when it's time to arrest the cops. Could you tease out the, the uh, reasons why uh your, all the arguments for agorism is, is, is couched in morality. Can you uh, talk about that and differentiate um, people who uh, interact voluntarily via, uh, compared to what the state does, which is uh, coercive? Ultimately, what we're talking about when, when you talk about the concerns that you just raised, you're, you're really leading into class theory. Um, the Marxists held that society was divided into classes that ultimately were simply a function of how much wealth someone had. And libertarian class theory is approximately 90 degrees from that. What we're saying is that it's not so much the wealth that one has, but how one goes about acquiring it. Because the state is banditry, it is in fact a system of theft, a forcible transfer of wealth that Two antagonistic social classes whose interests do not align with each other are created by the state. There are the productive class, the people who use voluntary interaction to make their daily bread, and there are those both in the literal government and those who are allied with the literal government through good old boy networks on a local basis or you know, rich defense contracts at a national level, what have you, who get their money by stealing it. That's all there really are in the world. There are the makers and there are the takers. What we're saying is that the makers can live without the takers.